Welcome to the Future of DeFi Fireside Chat series, a series of conversations with thought leaders in blockchain and DeFi. The Fireside Chat series is also part of the free and open DeFi MOOC class available at DeFi-learning.org to complement the technical nature of the course. It is co-hosted by Arthur Jervis, Professor of Computer Science in Imperial College of London, and me, Dong Song, Professor of Computer Science at UC Berkeley and the founder of Oasis Labs. The following is a conversation with Michael Igorov, CEO and founder of Curve Finance. Curve is a decentralized exchange and one of the biggest in existence with almost 20 billion US dollar of total value locked TVL. In this conversation, Michael shares unique designs of Curve, including its strong support for multiple chains, its mission to maintain a non-custodial DAO, its biggest crisis to date, and other valuable insights for DeFi and entrepreneurship. Here is our conversation with Michael Igrov. Uh, Michael, thanks a lot for uh, being with us. Uh, you have done a lot of really great work in DeFi. So, Looking at the uh, future of DeFi, then I think the first question is, what is really DeFi? So can you uh, talk to us a little bit about what in your mind is DeFi? Well, one can define DeFi as uh, um, some basically, basically financial instruments which work uh, in, a, like in an autonomous fashion on a public blockchain, right? And... Um, well, meaning that at least you don't need um, you don't need to run your own infrastructure. You have this decentralized infrastructure which uh, cannot be even stopped, right? Uh, like Ethereum blockchain. Um, but I think it's uh, uh, it it gets more interesting when you get into details, like what's um, like which projects are decentralized and which not like for example if admin has control over funds or admin does not have control over funds or uh, like admin does, doesn't have any control whatsoever um, and uh, who is this admin is it a DAO is it a, a company or a person is it a multi-sig so this is there is like all this sort of spectrum of uh, uh, you know decentralization but I think that one common thing is that all these DeFi projects run in a fully autonomous fashion on uh, on a public blockchain. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, great. Thanks. So essentially, yeah. Uh, so in your mind, right? So DeFi one, as you said, is autonomous. So essentially, it's this programmable. You can call it programmable money. It's right. This, uh, right. Uh, programmable uh, contracts that. Uh, uh, essentially provides financial instruments and yes in not stoppable so essentially for example it's uh, uh, censorship resilient and uh, it right. essentially can uh, continue to operate uh, and right. essentially under any circumstance i, I guess <laughs> well i mean it that depends on like degree of decentralization for example like um well uh, let's say if uh, if someone let's call call it an admin right wants to stop the service can the admin stop it right so, so, and um well for some projects uh, admin can for some other other projects admin cannot and for some other projects it's kind of in between like sometimes yes sometimes no so it it really uh, really depends and uh, there could be uh, like reasons for uh, for being able to stop something. Uh, for example, let's say to if some fatal flaw is found, and uh, you would need to able to be able to stop a smart contract in such a, uh, in such a case. For example, that, or um, let's say some projects uh, make smart contracts upgradable, and they need to be able to uh, to let's say if they want to fix something to be able to do that. But then, of course, the question is how is this upgrade power uh, guarded? Like who is who is having that? So that's uh, um, but yeah, that's. Uh, kind of, um, um, I guess, no single answer. So uh, for some, proje some projects are fully unstoppable, 
Um, I would say curve is pretty much that, or let's say Uniswap is also pretty much that, but some, some other projects um, I think are not uh, necessarily unstoppable because they, uh, they want to still be able to fix uh, things uh, because they like, let's say they don't yet uh, think their code is uh, like ready enough to be uh, like sailing fully autonomously. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So essentially, yeah, there's a spectrum. Yes, uh, there's right, a spectrum, um, yes. Essentially on this uh, degree of decentralization. Yes. And uh, right, in particular in terms of the governance. Right. And also, right, I guess it depends on the stage, what stage the project is in. Yeah, okay. yeah. But, uh, you, yeah, but we always also still like call all these projects DeFi more or less. And uh, I think one other important feature is that DeFi projects are composable. So you could use one project in another project. Like we, you, we can have, uh, you know, we have a pool which, um, you know, d takes uh, stable coins and while they are sitting in the pool, they are also being deposited to Arby, for example, or to Compound. So stuff like that. <clears throat> right, great. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. So this leads to the next question. So then why, why should people care about DeFi? Why um, is DeFi even developed? Like right. what purpose does it serve? Right, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know how about, you know, different users, but for, for myself, for example, um, some time ago, like I think in 2018, I needed, uh, well, for me, it started from basically borrowing against crypto. I didn't want to sell crypto, uh, but I wanted to, to spend while holding, right? So uh, I just opened a MakerDAO, uh, how it was called, CDP, and uh, borrowed DAI, right? And uh, then, you know, later on, let's say I returned DAI. So pretty much something like that. Um, but then, of course, there was a problem that, okay, when I have DAI, I need to exchange it to something which redeems to real US dollars. And uh, I started doing that on Coinbase, which worked pretty well but then kind of uh, 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 well the pricing wasn't as great so and uh, then I found this algorithm for for curve and launched it basically to to be uh, a user of that uh, myself uh, first of all right uh, but uh, yeah so you of course would ask why wouldn't uh, one do that uh, in like a centralized setting like let's say on an exchange or like centralized sort of lending right and uh, basically you know, with, with lending, I'm not sure I would trust cryptocurrencies uh, with cryptocurrencies to like centralized entities. It's, uh, they are not, not always 100% auditable and uh, they are not running autonomously. So they can do things and basically I would trust them and basically, and well, I wouldn't be comfortable with that. Right. Uh, and another thing, if you started doing something in a decentralized world, it makes sense to do other things in decentralized world so that you are not like jumping between this decentralized and centralized setting all the time. You can uh, do everything uh, decentralized. And then, well, all of a sudden, more and more uh, services work uh, decentralized. So I now pretty rarely exchange tokens on centralized exchanges. It really goes on decentralized ones just because, well, it's more convenient. Pricing is often better. And um, yeah, and also when it comes to lending, somebody is holding crypto for a long time, uh, which is kind of a collateralizes this thing. And I am not like very, um, very much trusting uh, centralized platforms, but decentralized ones are, they have different risks, I would say, and I'm more comfortable with those risks. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, great, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so for the extent to this, um, so if you look at, uh, if we look at, you know, the history, essentially, the history is about uh, a big part of it is how technologies advances and, and so on. So, so you mentioned in 2018, you were trying to write, uh, 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 for example, using MakerDAO 
to borrow money, now to have to sell your yeah, crypto and, and so on. So I think a bigger picture is like at that time, or even before then, maybe you participate in the blockchain space already. And like, did you expect that um, DeFi will be, um, you know, such an important application for, for blockchain? And, and an even broader question, um, so essentially, we can consider humanity as like a hive of collaborating, uh, non-collaborating individuals. Um, so, so why did this collective intelligence essentially come up with something like DeFi? Do you think that's... Well, really I mean, it's just uh, uh -huh. when you have programmable money, you will have people coming up with all sorts of innovations. And because it's permissionless, then it's, it's much easier to iterate on those innovations. Like imagine iterating on innovations in a bank. Uh, let's say you, uh, you found a new um, algorithm how to handle, I don't know, foreign currencies, right? How quickly will you deploy it in a bank? It would be like very, very slow, right? Uh, when in um, decentralized finance settings, yes, you need to ensure that everything is super safe, but it's pretty much like self-served innovations. So uh, people just, you know, just do it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, multiple things get tested. And uh, as for expecting the size, yeah, actually, yes, I did expect exactly about this size. Um, it was a uh, kind of a little, well, I mean, it's a little bit surprising that what I've uh, kind of planned uh, was uh, for, for the company was, uh, and for the project, that, that what I planned for the project actually turned out to be true, but it's not like shockingly surprising because like, I just felt that, uh, you know, this, um, let's say for stable coins, for example, uh, looked at like what, what are the trading volumes like stable coin to stable coin on centralized exchanges what, and uh, thought that, well, I mean, if, if the algorithm will be so much better than on centralized exchanges, it's uh, pretty much possible that everything will, uh, for stable coin to stable coin exchanges, migrate on chain. And uh, yeah, and then apparently the numbers appear to be like exactly what they are. Um, and of course, the other, um, like the other DeFi grew as well. And uh, yeah, it makes total sense, I think. Oh, I mean, this is, this is such a nice story that you have laid out here, right? Like you try, kind of saw an issue yourself, right? That you wanted to solve for yourself. Mm. That's why you built something because you're, you're by nature, you can create an, as an engineer, uh, like new protocols. And then you empower even more users beyond yourself, right? Right, you right, right. Or like an entire Many, generation. many more. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's so beautiful. Um, and also the way you're, you're, you're kind of touching on, on centralized finance, CFI and DeFi. So in, in what way do you believe they actually complement each other? So you, you're saying right now you're mostly staying in DeFi because you get cheaper prices. Well, I mean, uh, it also depends on what you, uh, what you call CFI, right? Mm -hmm. um, and well, if you call CFI centralized exchanges like Binance, I still use those for, uh, let's say, not for, not for large amounts of money, but for like smaller amounts of money, because uh, because I'm, I mean, I'm using that as a um, like something substituting lack of scalability on Ethereum because every Ethereum transaction is too expensive. But I think that is going to change pretty quickly with layer twos and whatever like other chains which have uh, like which are more scalable, for example. Uh, but also there, there are things like, you know, like banks, which don't go away. I'm just not keeping much money in banks, but I do use them as uh, like fired uh, on ramps and off ramps and uh, um, like ways to interact with a real uh, non-decentralized world. And I think they are not going away. So uh, at least it doesn't look like it. Uh, while like with centralized exchanges, I think they, they feel competition, right? And uh, well, that's why Binance is doing Binance Smart Chain because they, are, they, they thought, oh, maybe what if we ourselves will compete with ourselves? Why not, right? That's a smart decision, I guess. But um, like, 
yeah, I think centralized exchanges uh, really, uh, really feel the heat. And uh, they like, while Ethereum is not super scalable, they have some sort of, uh, you know, uh, some reason to, to be used, but also, uh, also actually, if you, some traders work in order book kind of setting, it also works better on a centralized exchange. So uh, they, they do have their applications, but they do also have a big portion of the market uh, eaten up by DeFi. Very interesting. And do you think this trend will continue? Do you think DeFi will be eating up more of this yeah, uh, yeah, part of yeah. I think I think so. I think so. Like uh, what we have, like let's say if we have more efficient cryptocurrency exchange algorithms, um, exchange between um, currencies of different denomination, right? Like, I mean, uh, not like not cryptos, but let's say fiat currencies, US dollar to euro to whatever, right? Um, that's kind of another thing, right? And uh, also another thing like which DeFi is currently kind of suffers from is so-called impermanent loss, which is not necessarily a loss, but an artifact of, uh, uh, of um, automated market makers. When you have, um, let's say, um, constantly balanced portfolio pretty much like you have an AMM which balances your portfolio and makes money on, on top of that right and when you balance your portfolio you actually uh, apparently the value of this portfolio when the prices change is smaller than the value uh, of all the coins which you had initially if you didn't keep them in, in this um, in, in this portfolio uh, but AMMs of course earn fees on top of that so they can kind of overcome this sort of loss but anyway uh, it's um, like for for many people it would be nice to just deposit one asset and uh, now you know make fees on, on that asset that's probably why uh, her finance is so popular because you basically exchange between us dollar and us dollar pretty often and uh, then your portfolio is just us dollar and it doesn't really have um it doesn't really have a permanent loss but when you have different sort of currencies you you have this artifact and it would be nice to to kind of somehow get rid of of it and yeah there are ways i think so i'm kind of thinking about those but like there are like many things which uh, need to be solved and there are many applications which can be um, can be launched there and i think they that's all possible and uh, it's just there is like still a lot a lot of room for uh, for inventing something new i guess our students will love to hear this and uh, mm -hmm. future young researchers <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. There's, yes, there's a lot of room for new things. Yeah, uh, and really, for like, coming to that from research perspective is, is, like, really, I think, the right way to do it. Like, for example, I just, um, well, thought, thought of some way, like, when you can uh, exchange from one coin to another slowly, like, well, when you have two really many coins, and this is... Uh, feels extremely similar to like so-called um, avoided crossing in quantum physics or how it's called a uh, landau zener transition. But this is like physics and this is like mining. So what's the similarity? Apparently there, there are many similarities. And uh, if, you, if you, you are exposed to uh, like something seemingly unrelated but you know deeply mathematical you you may find something really similar in uh in like um uh, in car cryptocurrency world and um you know also apply this and you know experiment with that well i mean if, if it's a safe experiment of course uh, great great yeah thank you so uh going a little deeper on DeFi, uh, so Everyone uh, knows today um, the way DeFi protocol is measured is mostly by TVL, total value locked, which mm -hmm. essentially measures how much asset has been um, deposited uh, in the uh, DeFi protocol. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so do you think TVL is an appropriate metric? to rank the popularity of DeFi protocols? Right. Well, I mean, I think partly, not necessarily 100%, because you can imagine this. Imagine that you have, I don't know, 
you have ETH, right? And let's say you make a protocol called ETH holder. You can deposit ETH and it just sits there. And then you uh, make another protocol, uh, ETH holder holder, which holds, uh, which deposits money to ETH holder. And you can make this 10 times and uh, here we go. You have, I don't know, uh, 10 ethers sitting in your DeFi ecosystem uh, while uh, it was actually really one ether deposited and really this ether is doing nothing. So just TVL is probably not, uh, not super great of a metric, but it's relevant in many cases. Yeah, this is a great example. And I wonder like when people uh, calculate the overall TVL in DeFi, like how much of this actually happens, right? We see, we do see that the same asset essentially is being amplified. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question really, because like, I, I think some statistics websites actually subtract, um, like when they calculate the total like value in DeFi, they subtract these like cross references. Um, I think uh, D-Bank did something doing like it. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't remember what was what's the DeFi size if you remove the duplication. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's. Uh, I think I, it was I, about twenty percent smaller only, if I'm not mistaken. No, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. so it's only 20%, which is redeposited in water. Oh, interesting. I thought that would be more. <laughs> but yeah. Um. Right. So since TBL has, uh, uh, you know, these uh, various issues, what do you think? What other metrics uh, would you consider appropriate alternatives to metrics? Well, I mean, I mean, it's like not, not that one metric should be looked and other not. It's more like, well, um, one metric is uh, obviously like for exchanges could be trading volume, right? Another metric could be like um, protocol revenue, right? It could be a revenue of the whole system or could be revenue just over DAO. And that's actually, you know, uh, they are not the same thing. Because like, if you think about it, uh, for example, uh, on Curve, you have uh, Curve DAO and um, Curve pools. Liquidity providers earn pretty much, you know, 50% uh, of what the pools earn, and another 50% is going to curve DAO. And also, uh, but liquidity providers, in addition to fees they earn, they also earn the uh, uh, curve DAO tokens, CRV, right? Uh, and um, anyway, so this uh, revenue there, which is coming from fees, uh, it's going to both DAO and uh, liquidity providers. Whereas uh, for on Uniswap, DAO gets uh, zero and uh, everything is going to liquidity providers. So the admin fee is zero and uh, you know that's uh, kind of a um, little bit different. So, uh, but you know, the uh, amounts earned are pretty good to measure, but also they, they are not always easy to measure because for example, we have um, let's say we have a crypto pool, right? Which, um, uh, which if, if you measure by fees, it actually uh, would be showing numbers much, much bigger than what it actually earns because it's uh, apparently like it, it has some um, interesting mechanics when you uh, adjust like a uh, price where the liquidity is maximum. And when you do that, you experience uh, some loss. So this loss is subtracted from profit and profit is actually less than what you have from just measuring fees. And well, of course, we are all account accounting for all of that inside the smart contract. But for example, Uniswap 3 doesn't account for that. So if you measure just fees, it will be like, oh, well, really big fees. But also there is a big loss when you you move out of range and what is what what money are people actually making well that's a good question so in principle it would be really nice uh, way a thing to measure but uh, it's sometimes hard to measure sometimes you may measure that you the protocol is making only losses and not no profits that's uh, uh, but Maybe not, because who knows, maybe users are doing something on the side which makes this operation profitable. So um, uh, it's, uh, but in principle, it would, be, it would be a good metric. Like for example, if it's a lending protocol which is taking fees, it's clear that you know, all these fees go to revenue of the protocol and yeah, this is uh, kind of no brainer, right? Uh, so 
um, sometimes it's uh, it's easy to to measure. Great, great, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, so a follow-up question. So it appears that the majority of the DeFi activity is concentrated among a set of wills, uh, essentially the really large right, token holders, and also flash file style high frequency traders. Right. Uh, is your experience? Do you agree? Um. Oh uh, yes, that's uh, that's actually true. I think because especially on Ethereum, on Ethereum right now there are transaction fees are pretty large. They can be like you know fifty dollars, hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, and when a transaction costs one hundred dollars, you probably wouldn't exchange one thousand dollars if you lose one hundred dollars to fees. So um, then, only like big big swaps start making sense. Let's say hundred thousand dollars plus. Right, and uh, those transactions can can be done only by um, you know by whales, by by these bots and whatever. And the bots they could they actually could do arbitrage. Let's say they can arbitrage with centralized exchanges where gas fee is not an issue, right? And uh, you know small traders trade on centralized exchanges. The price move moves moves over there and if it moves really really much then you know arbitrage bot for example you know makes a, an exchange on like you know both platforms centralized and decentralized and uh, basically making profit on that and those transactions are extremely common especially with uh, pools of uh, different denomination, like you know, Ethereum to Bitcoin to USD, right? If you look at uh, you know our three crypto two pool and like ERC twenty transactions, you may see that maybe like ninety five percent of the transactions is some uh, um, someone labeled as you know so, some sort of mev bot or something. Uh, so uh, and that's uh, like I think that's mainly because of Ethereum scalability issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So then, how do you think, how could we uh, make DeFi more inclusive? Right. I think, uh, like, development of uh, layer twos, blockchains more scalable than Ethereum, that all help uh, on this regard. For example, if you look at, uh, you know, we, we are now launched on uh, Polygon, Phantom, Arbitrum, which is layer two, um, so if you look at all uh, those uh, blockchains, you may notice that uh, the average uh, transaction size is actually really, really much, much smaller than on Ethereum, but transactions go much more frequently. And that's because, because they are uh, much cheaper over there. And that's because either, either the blockchain is more scalable than Ethereum, or maybe it is more centralized and that's why it is more scalable. Um, well, also there is Binance Smart Chain, but it's kind of already not that cheap as, as those chains are layer twos, but it's also not as expensive as, uh, as Ethereum, right? But it, clearly for, for like for inclusiveness, the, the question of transaction cost is probably the key question. Do you think, uh, that's great. Um, do you think besides transaction fees, are there other factors that in, impact the inclusiveness? Yeah, I think it's also complexity of how you interact with the system. Because like if you, um, well, let's say, what do we do? Like if we use, um, if we use, uh, MetaMask, for example, to interact with the blockchain, then you have all sorts of uh, uh, UX issues. And uh, I don't know if it's, uh, uh, if it's good for people or not, if, if they like it or not. But I think like sometimes I need to bump transaction you know, four times before it actually gets broadcasted, stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think like this, Lots of um, UI issues uh, have to be fixed to achieve mass adoption. And not to mention that uh, hardware security uh, modules, like hardware wallets, are not so easy for, for a mass user to use, especially when you like, um, you know, connect it to 
um, I don't know, to, uh, to, to your computer, and uh, then it appears that uh, it's not so easy to make it work in your browser because, you know, also all sorts of issues. So it's like a little clunky at the moment, and that's another factor. And at the same time, you want to use your hardware wallet and not store everything in MetaMask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, and, the story goes on. Uh, yeah. and another thing, another thing is that there are uh, like, well, there is a lot of fraud in this space. Uh, like, it's pretty much low key fraud. Like, you know, like uh, scammers approaching people on Telegram and you know, announcing, impersonating someone, uh, announcing some you know, um, bonuses, airdrops, whatever, or that's happening on Twitter is also very common. And uh, yeah, so for, for, for an experienced user, it's not a problem. Like they always, when they see, uh, you know, when they see um, great news or when they see a bonus or when they see like uh, you know give away like those are uh, uh, that kind of almost immediately means that it's some, you know some scammer is trying to scam someone right but for users who are new to blockchain they see oh i can get you know 20 percent to on top of what i have that's great <laughs> right and uh, then they lose 100 percent right so that's that kind of stuff or also like of course there are not uh, sometimes not so good projects starting who who eventually like steal customer money that that's also happening sometimes so but that's i think um probably that requires some um, how to say uh like when the ecosystem grows up this probably goes away uh, to some degree mm -hmm. Um, so congratulations, right, on, on having deployed Curve on so many uh, second layer or, or side chains. Um, I think you've been quite like pushy towards this uh, more inclusiveness of other chains and to to help users uh, right, right. with the adoption, which is which is beautiful. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the story? So what were your hurdles? What was what was what was easy, um, and and how you plan this uh, going forward in the future? Mm. Uh, you mean just in general? Uh, what was oh, on, on, on the yeah? What was what was kind of easy or what was difficult when when deploying on alternative chains? Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, so what we need for deploying on alternative chains is well, first of all, we want to connect all of that to the Curve DAO. We don't want just an independent deployment, which uh, which is totally like a fork of, of Curve on a different chain. We want like everything to, to go to the DAO and benefit all like uh, DAO participants, right? So for that, we need two things. We need, well, at least at, at the minimum, we need... Uh, First of all, the fees, admin fees from that chain to go back to Ethereum, right? Where, where they get distributed. And we want uh, CRV token emissions to be able to go from Ethereum to the other chain. That also needs to happen in a non-custodial manner. So we don't want to be like, uh, uh, to be touching any funds for like there are different reasons like safety reasons range uh, attack reason right regulatory reasons uh, many reasons so and um well many bridges they actually support this feature so what you need for that is just to be able to send uh tokens from inside a smart contract to a different uh, chain, pretty much, right? And not all bridges support that. So if you if you take, for example, I don't know, an official Binance chain bridge uh, uh, provided by Binance, it's I think targeting users, so it cannot really have a smart contract bridging uh, funds. But some other bridges uh, they allow to uh, to do this. And how do, but I mean, those, those bridges, how do you realize them in a secure manner? And how do you do this um, emission from, from, uh, from governance token curve from the main mm. chain to- Yeah, to the... that's, uh, that's actually pretty easy. We, uh, well, there are, 
we have system of gauges which measure i don't know measure things right and also uh, like depending on what they measured they distribute um, the emissions and each uh, kind of pool each pool gets a certain portion of total emissions uh, voted on by governance right um, let's say you define that some pool on another chain gets, you know, this much of emissions, right? And um, what we do, we simply um, collect the, you know, these emissions, like this, you know, the, this pro pro proportion, how much it is, it can change every week. So we collect uh, these tokens for a week and then we fund, uh, you know, the smart, a smart contract uh, transfers these uh, funds to another chain, right? When you say we, it's not you, right? It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, the DAO, yeah, yeah. right? The DAO, yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's like anyone can execute kind of thing when uh, you, you when this, a smart contract which collected uh, uh, CRV tokens sends them to a different chain, mm. right? Uh, via the bridge to another smart contract, which is uh, like how we call it a streamer, right? And then uh, once the tokens appear there, if they come uh, came there, uh, the streamer can can start streaming, and then it's just you know streaming rewards over a week or something. Beautiful. So yeah, and uh, that all happens like because it all happens between the smart contracts, even though there is a bridge in between, which is uh, you know always scary, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's it can be operated. Uh, in a it can can run in a non-custodial manner and like whoever executes these few transactions uh, which need to happen it still works and whoever executes doesn't touch the money so on the ethereum side are these tokens uh, burnt or are they locked uh well oh when you bridge him in mm -hmm. uh, well it's uh, i think it's actually the bridge uh, locks these tokens, but uh, when somebody receives those tokens and withdraws them using the bridge, the, these tokens which were locked go to, to that guy. But that's about how the bridge is constructed pretty much. All right, beautiful. So we, we don't uh, build bridges ourselves, by the way, because it's like not our speciality. It's uh, like the whole, a uh, whole different world. We uh, probably think that you know those who are good at bridges should be building bridges, and we will just use them. And it's a beautiful composable DeFi world, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so security is quite a, a major concern, also in a high list on on your priority, as far as I can tell. Yes. Um, so you've seen recently uh, Compound uh, accidentally yeah. paid out uh, comp tokens. Um, through, right. a, through an upgrade of the protocol or a proposal. Yep. Um, I, uh, so, so can you tell me more about how you handle security in general? At, at right. I guess our approach to security of smart contracts is a very, very different from what Compound does um, or from what my, uh, like most projects do. Well, first of all, most projects use, use Solidity and we use Viper. And the difference is Solidity is a bit more, a more mature language. So it's uh, in principle should be, the compiler should be uh, like more developed, uh, should be safer. But the language itself is uh, much less readable. Uh, so Viper reminds uh, Python and uh, Solidity reminds, well, I don't know what, um, C++ maybe, um, maybe not, not quite. Um, well, some sort of, uh, also like gives a feeling of JavaScript sometimes, but not really, right? Um, anyway, so it's um, less readable, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, much better to have something more readable and also with all the, um, immediate dependencies not being 
scattered across different contracts, but basically being in front of you. Of course, you can say, yeah, well, if you have a good ID, it will jump between contracts and uh, you will be fine. Um, well, I guess not really, because like it still hurts auditability. It, you, like when you have everything in front of you, it's, it's more readable and also the code actually it's shorter usually um but you know that's one thing um and that kind of uh, we compromise a little bit on uh, like how good uh, how how well developed the compiler is uh but we win on the side of uh, like how how easy it is to check the code with your eyes and how easy it is for developer to not make mistakes Right, but of course mistakes can happen, and uh, we also write like a super extensive set of tests. It's not like even you know getting hundred uh, percent coverage, which is important. It's also important to kind of really uh, do all sorts of uh, integration tests, fuzzing, whatever. So you need to really check, not just make sure that you ran you know this piece of code once. You need to make sure you ran it in like the broad range of uh, parameters which could uh, happen in the system, right? So it's like if just exchanging, you know, one dollar to to one dollar is uh, in a test is just well, it's great, but it's not giving you this um, a safety guarantee as if you try to um, you know ex all the amounts and not just exchange, but also like deposits, withdrawals, on like in random order, whatever, uh, some so-called stateful tests, um, and that. Uh, helps uh, a lot to achieve uh, smart contract safety, right? Also our contracts, just for the sake of reducing complexity, are not upgradable, right? So, uh, and that's um, another, I would say, compromise. Um, when contracts are upgradable, the complexity is much higher and also you are in control in a way, or I don't know, somebody is in control, maybe a DAO, right? Maybe, a, or maybe some operator. Um, if there is a bug in a contract, you can fix it if it's upgradable. And if it's not upgradable, you cannot fix it. But at the same time, if the smart contract is not upgradable, then, uh, well, at least in Compound's case, uh, I think the problem was in uh, kind of upgradability mechanism, right? Uh, more or less. And uh, no, if, if it's not upgradable, it's less complexity, less probability to make uh, this mistake. But if you've made a mistake somewhere else, you, you cannot fix it. You, you need to make sure really well in advance that the smart contract is uh, doing what it, it is supposed to do. And um, like if you already have users in the smart contract, if you discovered that uh, you know, something is wrong, you need to somehow ask users to migrate funds to a safer smart contract. Also for this um, particular case, we like every smart contract we deploy, it's actually um, well, killable uh, for first two months of existence. So it can be um, like, well, if it's killed, users can only withdraw money, but uh, everything else stops working. And that, uh, really helps because let's say if uh, if there is something it can be killed and then users have all time in the world to migrate um, funds from uh, contract to contract the very first contract we had it was actually you know the very first version of compound pool um, it actually had a flaw which uh, would have allowed uh, to be exploited uh, a white hat uh, Samsung approached us and uh, basically telling this flaw and that contract did not have this uh, freeze feature so users had to be like told to migrate funds but in such a way that a hacker wouldn't find what the error is well fortunately the uh, well that was pretty early and users were aware that it's uh, like could be scary so they migrated all funds in within three days and i think it was 
um, I don't know, four dollars dollars left and I do after that and saw something. <laughs> what an amazing <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's a great story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, right, so so right, so Sam will uh, be giving the uh, the security lecture. Yeah, great. Uh, guess you yeah, know he, he's really great yes yeah. so he, he is like you know uh, helping to keep everything secure and uh, hopefully makes good money from that <laughs> yeah. well, it, that's amazing so so DeFi security is certainly a multi-layered problem right so you you, you you've now mostly spoken about the smart contract layer yeah. but there might be the uh, network layer which is maybe more low level there might be the consensus layer there might mm. be the the application, like the, the web interface layer, you're hosting a web app, right? That people kind of right, trust. Right. Um, so how do you how do you handle, or what kind of user protections do you have on mm. the UI side, for instance? Well, I mean, in, in UI, it's not, actually there is not much, uh, there are not many possibilities to lose money, right? Uh, um, like, well, if there is a bug in UI, usually it's like, um, usually just the transaction is, malformed and doesn't work and yeah you you like really need to do it totally wrong to uh, to do something bad and so it's much much easier to make it safe on on ui it's if something is wrong there it's more annoying than safe than unsafe so it's uh, i mean it depends right if for example you don't have a good slippage protection there or the slippage oh, yeah, protection yeah. is somehow uh, faulty yeah true, true, then, true. then yeah. you might get squeezed right quite a bit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, that's true that's true yeah so so we like do have some um some slippage protections maybe maybe it's good to uh, to try to integrate this uh a way of submitting uh, transactions when they don't appear in a public mempool and get mined privately. That's kind of the latest fashion, which we mm -hmm. didn't integrate yet, but we have this protection where you say, you know, if if the price appears below something, you know, don't uh, don't execute, right? Um, oh, great. Uh, uh, thanks, Michael. So um, talking a little bit more on the DeFi adoption side, so as we know, many new launches of uh, DeFi protocols give huge incentives uh, to users to attract uh, liquidity and to get higher TVL. Right. This is right, also known as yield farming. Uh, so what do you think uh, how effective this method is and does it cause a problem for TVL yeah. migration? From this, protocols to protocols? Uh, yeah, this method is actually extremely effective and uh, we do use that. But uh, there is um, one thing about this method. If you distribute a token which is doing nothing, uh, which doesn't have any, um, like any way, any reason to be valuable apart from speculation, then when you distribute this token, people obviously sell it. Well, I mean, uh, not not everyone wants to hold it and I think majority will be sold and the price of this token obviously goes down. So to make that not happen, you need to somehow connect the token to, uh, to the kind of value accrual part, right? And uh, just governance, I think it's not quite, um, not quite the right, uh, the right way to to get value to the token because it's like how what uh, what sort of value does the governance power have right it's mm, i don't know My, maybe not so much uh maybe it is but uh, i think it's uh much better to have something else in in addition so we have this kind of the dao um has the fee distribution mechanism it's not going directly to the token it's going to those who locked the token but uh indirectly it's helping um it's kind of creating this you know uh, not upwards pressure when you have downwards pressure so in our system it's important that we have two streams we have uh you know a token can go in one way and uh, um, admin fees go in the other way and only then it can be kind of a, a self-sustained system otherwise you would uh, if you distribute a token and people you know uh, do uh, something and it goes down uh, well somebody 
I don't know, VC is by the token of what happens, like it's strange. Uh, but another great example, actually our token, uh, it has um, a voting power and the ability to receive uh, these DAO revenues only when it's locked, right? And the longer it's locked for, the more uh, voting power and more revenue it gets, right? So it's called so something we call the ECRV. So if uh, let's say one day is left before unlocking, you maybe have uh, 365 times less voting power and uh, fee accrual power than uh, something locked for one year. Uh, so this locked CRV is actually a really valuable thing. So a project called Convex, they did actually a very smart thing, I would, I would say. They started distributing their token to uh, in exchange for this um, VE CRV essentially. So people give CRV to, to the uh, contact smart contract, which locks CRV and uh, you know, boosts uh, uh, CRV farming, uh, you know, get, gets all sorts of perks, which, uh, which uh, VE CRV has. And, you know, the thing is that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe that token is uh, uh, initially uh, looking like a short term temp temporary thing, but when they exchange it for something which is long term, which is VE CRV, then they uh, have something powerful in their protocol and that can translate to, to kind of value for their protocol, value for their token and whatever. And uh, that was actually an interesting smart play. But the thing is that if you distribute token, you need to have something going back to your system in exchange for this token. Because if it's just distributed, uh, I guess then it will be, um, it, it may not work. It will just suppress the price of the token. Right, great, great, yeah, thank you. Um, so right, so so talking about this, also right, so DeFi in DeFi it has so many great ideas, um, and also it's great that it's open and transparent. So then one thing I think we have seen also that it's easier for for people to copy the ideas, right? And also in no. this case, given that the code is uh, available and, and so on, then people don't just copy the idea; they can actually. Mm. The copy plus token and then paste forking. Right, uh, right. right. So we've seen right so many many versions um, of this. Oh. Right. So how do you think um, the DeFi project should practice a healthy balance between open source code and uh, true, true. Property? Well, I mean, one thing is that for safety of the code, you just cannot have um, a smart contract code not available. Right. So. And that, that's kind of, that's the most important thing. And um, of course, when it is available, yes, people can copy, people can launch um, sort of similar products. And yeah, I mean, in our code, it's it's kind of copyright copyrighted. So it cannot really um, like, not allowed legally to be copied, but we didn't enforce this. And there are some uh, projects which did fork it. And um, yeah, uh, well, one thing is that we uh, specifically kind of um, designed our, our system with the DAO to make it um, to make it like self-sustained. And um, it's actually the whole system which. Uh, sort of uh, protects uh, itself, right? So even if the code is copied, it's actually not easy to, um, to kind of, to, to grow comparable to, to what uh, Curve is, because it's, uh, because Curve this, um, has this well-established feedback loop, which is um, like you, not easy to stop and not easy to, uh, to build something like that uh, as well. Uh, not not easy to to spin it up to to this degree, I would say. So it's it turns out that this system with the um, token inflation and um, and uh, DAO revenues going kind of this way is uh, it's it's sort of self sustaining. It it allows to um, to kind of 
it allows the system to fight competition without uh, asking uh, lawyers to do that. <laughs> so speaking, speaking of lawyers and uh, maybe regulations, um, do you think DeFi is currently under-regulated? Uh, yeah, well, uh, good question. I think um, I would say that um, not sure about DeFi, but I think that traditional finance is overregulated, at least. And also, I think that regulators kind of uh, they started forgetting uh, what these regulations are for initially. They are supposedly to protect customers, right? And I think DeFi is extremely different from traditional finance. Uh, uh, like in traditional finance, um, it's, it was not a question that operator of some financial service can take money or do something bad, right? It was just natural. Like if you hold money, you like, how can you not take it? So, so then uh, some measures should be done to, uh, to prevent uh, malicious actors from taking money, right? That's why these regulations appeared to start with, and then they discovered, okay, maybe there are some other malicious actions. For example, if a trading platform does something bad with the orders, then I don't know, it's whatever, flash crash, right? Uh, and uh, in uh, DeFi, you can make things such that you don't actually trust any operator at all, right? And this never existed before. Like in DeFi, we sometimes uh, call protocols where admin can take money uh, ruggable, right? So the admin can rug pull and you know, take money and disappear, right? Uh, and by this terminology, traditional finance is just uh, all ruggable, right? And that, that's how it was. And that's why regulations were so much needed. Here, I think regulations, um, if, I mean, first of all, they, they still need to protect customers rather than some, anything else. And instead of trying to fit uh, old regulations, probably regulators should, um, should think who, who they are protecting and how to do that. And uh, in DeFi to protect customers, you, the main thing I think is to ensure code safety, right? To, to make sure that unsafe code doesn't get marketed uh, while it's uh, unsafe, right? Uh, at least maybe, maybe that. Or maybe customers should be informed about which DeFi project is uh, like really uh, fully decentralized and which is so-called like ruggable, right? And when it's ruggable, what they, I don't know, like what measures, uh, what sort of protections uh, should be in place. But that's, um, like, I think that, that those are the lines I would be uh, thinking in how to approach DeFi regulations. But I've never seen regulators uh, doing that. I think regulators try to think a different way. Like they say, we have old laws which worked for 100 years and they protected customers in equity world. So they should be applicable here. And we just should find analogies with traditional um, you know, traditional finance world and uh, apply here because this is the law after all, right? And um, I think that approach doesn't quite work here. I think it's, uh, it needs, needs to be rethought. Yeah, you're taking a particular uh, effort in, in, in really decentralizing Curve, for instance, right? I mean, with the factory contracts uh, yeah. or, or pools now that everybody can deploy. Um, right. I think this is this is an often underestimated difficulty and effort that goes into into really trying to be non-custodial, as you mentioned also earlier regarding yeah, cross chain yeah, yeah. transactions. It's, it's, like, uh, it's not easy sometimes. Yes, it's it's very hard to to make this in a, in a secure manner. So the the concept of decentralization is is not uh, is, is is quite. Uh, I, I guess it, it, there are many shades of gray of decentralized protocols, right? So some are not at all decentralized. Right. Some are more. So um, yeah, I guess I guess it's a, it's a nice insight for you to to kind of suggest that the regulators should maybe certify uh, to what degree someone or some project is decentralized. Yeah. I think uh, it makes sense even uh, just from informational perspective. Just users have to know, like, is it uh, really like what 
what the admins of the project can potentially do like what is the worst they can do if they turn bad right and uh, um, well another question is like what is done to so that they don't turn bad but um, yeah it's and I think if regulators just start from informing people but I think they don't do that so because if we go as you said right if we go from the stance we want to protect users which regulations should then there sh I mean, it, it's natural to realize that having the power of a non-custodial wallet comes with a lot of responsibilities. Of course, yeah. So the regulators could, for instance, educate users on, on how to use these wallets in a secure right. way, etc. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another another thing. And also, I like um, at some point, I don't know how about now. I have all my ads blocked in my browser. But if I don't block ads and I search for like any DeFi project, all the ads are scams. So like all Google ads are scams. And, you know, I don't think advertisers get uh, any, uh, take any responsibility for that. Neither does Google. And that's bad. These, these are great uh, ideas and uh, uh, great points. And um, so we uh, talked a bit about, you know, your general thoughts uh, on DeFi and so on. So maybe now let's talk a little bit about your actually day-to-day -day life, your personal experience in DeFi. So I'm sure, you know, a lot of students and uh, uh, a lot of the audience wants to know, uh, for example, how does your day look like in DeFi? Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, in like a user or like a developer of the protocol. And uh, let's see more from the from the user side. Ah, yeah, user yeah. Side. yeah. I mean, I want to learn more about DeFi. Also. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I do use DeFi every day, and uh, it often looks like, well, uh, I can. One of the major things is what I usually did, like you know borrowing uh, money against crypto and well could use those money to make more money could spend those money uh, and uh, apparently right now there are interesting opportunities because you can uh, like when you have crypto you don't have to have it passive you can have crypto making uh, you know sitting in an automatic market maker and then you apparently can borrow uh, some uh, uh, some stable coins against crypto in automatic market maker so while you have crypto over there it makes money pretty good money in fact and when you borrow you uh, well you borrow but apparently you, while you have the loan there let's say the uh, fee for the loan is smaller than the money you make on uh, let's say crypto you uh, borrowed against because it's sitting in automatic market make and that's kind of uh, that's that, that stuff is kind of fun i think uh, so and um, I'm not much into NFTs. I'm more like uh, into uh, just, you know, just DeFi, I would say. But also, the, uh, it's it all comes to kind of, um, I don't know, different opportunities or different things being more effective. And uh, so, like, in principle, it could be passive. But uh, for me, maybe it's not, not that much passive because I, I do uh, kind of sometimes discover opportunities which I didn't see before. And uh, that's, uh, I don't know, that, that's just fun, I would say this. And also, uh, what are your favorite tools in DeFi mm. uh, that, that helps you? <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, obviously, um, Curve Finance is a good tool. For other thing, for uh, exchange, I actually like to go through aggregators and the right exchange, uh, decentralized exchange aggregators like OneInch and Paraswap. Um, I think uh, I think recently OneInch uh, restricted United States users, uh, yeah, so it's more like Paraswap for for the US at the moment, I guess. Um, <laughs> And but still, like you aggregate multiple sources, which is great. And uh, also, what else do I use often? I use lending protocols a lot. Uh, so mm -hmm. I used uh, well, started with MakerDAO, then I started using um, Compound, Avi. Uh, there are also like different uh, uh, different stable coins. Um, 
which you can mint against cryptocurrencies or against <laughs> money in, in pools, such as, um, uh, well, there, are, there is uh, unit uh, protocol, there is meme, uh, which is uh, <laughs> so, a funny okay. name, there is uh, uh, LUSD. So all, all of these I kind of tried uh, for essentially borrowing uh, sake. And uh, yeah, they all have their, you know, their own, um, you know, pros and cons. So that's... Uh, <laughs> right, great. And then besides these DeFi protocols, are there like other tools that you find it helpful mm. for you? Yeah, well, there are tools to, there are actually good tools to interact with Ethereum blockchain itself, right? And of course, I mean, everybody knows wallets and, you know, MetaMasks and whatever. But I also like, uh, very much like tool called Brownie, when you, where you can interact, well, you can test smart contracts there, but you also can interact with Ethereum or other blockchains right from the terminal. So you can say, you know, that like, pool equal this, right? And the pool equal contract from Explorer, whatever address. And then, you know, pool dot, I don't know, deposit, right? Uh, or, or whatever. And it does introspection. It shows you what, uh, uh, what you can do with this smart contract much, much um, easier than what you could see in, um, yeah, on Etherscan. Um, but that's not in the browser. It's like uh, this is like a, a command line application, I would say. Uh, so you can ha have an interactive console, but that's kind of that's also cool because it's uh, you know for for engineers, right? For engineers, we need uh, better tools still. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, um, it's for sure, ongoing... for sure. Right, right. I like uh, yeah, it's like what's. Uh, and not not so many good debuggers, right? Right. So, what kind of like breakthroughs do you think do we need? Like, I mean, whether it's on on the on the engineer on the developer side, or whether it's on the solving the implemented loss uh, issue side, what what breakthroughs do you think does DeFi need to 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 grow further, and how can we get there? Mm -hmm. I think solving an implement loss would be great. Um, I think, um, like, um, well, I think it's good that we do collateralized lending, but I think it's probably important to, um, somehow try to reduce reliance on, um, on external oracles to have, uh, the, uh, financial data like price data being generated and recorded uh, on chain or uh, like without uh, without any third party service for that and um, I guess we probably want to support different sorts of assets like that's why we, we think about um, markets between uh, stable coins of different uh, fiat denominations because I think something is uh, something good is possible there um, yeah so I guess uh, these things come to mind but also like for if, if we, we talk about exchanges there are like many other things which are a little bit niche for people who, who like want to, to do um, like I don't know to to let's say buy or sell large amounts of coins. Apparently, this uh, can can result into interesting products. Um, I didn't look much into derivative products uh, like you know uh, futures, like you know futures options, whatever. I kind of I'm not much uh, of a specialist in there, so I couldn't really comment of what's uh, of what can be done there. But I'm sure something can be. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, great. Yeah, thank you. So since we are talking about future of DeFi, uh, so if you have a magic wand, what would you like the DeFi world to look like in five years? Mm. Well, I don't know if it's possible uh, in five years, but I can quite see DeFi uh, well, more or less uh, modernizing the world financial system. It's uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, optimistic to say that, but I think that might happen. In what sense? Can you elaborate a little bit? <laughs> oh, well, I think in a sense that um, um, 
well, if you if you look at what uh, at how banks work, right? They have really antiquated um, antiquated uh, backend systems, I would say, and not only banks. Like it's like many traditional finance uh, things. So if we have some uh, you know global blockchain layer doing uh, doing that task. And also that layer being permissionless so that everyone can participate. Well, I mean, I think still banks have place uh, over there. They would be, uh, they would sit on top of that, but not necessarily. It could also be interacted with uh, directly. So I think that's, uh, that sounds like a sensible future, but I don't think it's going to be in five years. Uh, great. Any, any, any other financial functions uh, or services you think uh, DeFi is going to play a much bigger role in five years? Right. Again, if you have a magic wand, um, mm -hmm. how do you yeah, think how the world will be different? <laughs> other than different functions, it would be more about convenience of using DeFi. Yes, I think right mm -hmm. now it's uh, it's pretty clunky. Like I wouldn't say that... Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that uh, my grandmother would easily use that, no. So that's uh, um, something to, to greatly improve on. And, but there are even these things are hard to formulate because there are many small things which all uh, like uh, come together in, in its, like overall experience, like whether it's convenience, whether it's safety, you know, some, certain things like that. Like even even automatic market makers, um, automatic market makers started from um, I think more or less from Bancor and then uh, Uniswap shortly after and Kyber, right? And uh, these first at first these um, tools were not uh, not super effective, right? But uh, they were first, and they, they they were like really much needed. And uh, it's after that it was mostly like uh, mm, improving efficiency of the same function, right? Um, and I think um, I think we will probably have more of um, efficiency improving, whether it's algorithms, whether it's uh, user experience or whatever. But many of the functions of DeFi, I think uh, they are, they have, they have been prototyped at least, I would say, right? So it's um, just a uh, matter of, uh, matter of getting them like working well or like improving algorithms, but it's it's hard to say it all in one word. Great, great, yeah, thank you. I was quite impressed by the um, by the um, by the novelty of stable swap. So by the bonding curve, right, which mm. which um, really lowers slippage, in particular for for stablecoin or packed assets in general. Mm -hmm. um, can you can you tell us a bit how you how you got there? Like, what was your kind of your thought process? Of yeah, well, I thought about liquidity in terms of liquidity density, um, and uh, translated that to the language of bonding curves. So if you um, think that. You know what would you need to uh, to to achieve good efficiency of stablecoin swaps? You need to concentrate liquidity in a narrow range, uh, in you know close to uh, close to one, right? And then it should hopefully gradually uh, fall down to the edges, right? And what sort of bonding curve would would be uh, would be for that? So um, well. In Uniswap, you have just a hyperbola, right? Which is, uh, um, you know, kind of the same everywhere, right? And if you have, for example, a line, a straight line, it will be a constant price bonding curve, right? But when you start bending it a little bit, it means that it starts supporting uh, multiple prices because uh, the price is actually the slope or the derivative of the, of the bonding curve. And uh, yeah, so basically um, I first imagined how the bonding curve should look like 
I, uh, you know, drew it. Uh, and then I started thinking what sort of formula would have those properties. So, and maybe after, um, after a couple of weeks thinking, I arrived at, a, uh, at an invariant which gives that uh, sort of shape without being uh, too difficult to solve in a smart contract. Mm -hmm. So naturally, your your background is quite heavily math based, but yes. you're actually a physicist, right? I am. Yes, I'm experimental physicist. In fact, right. So, in in what way did did uh, did this experience or this background shape shape you as a person, and also gives you kind of a competitive edge in DeFi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess one thing is um, well. Uh, Having a um, mathematical, I would say, analytical background, it, uh, I guess, allows to invent uh, things which are deeply mathematical. And, um, well, mathematicians like to prove things. I'm not good at that. So I'm, uh, and, you know, when you are a physicist, you are a little bit, you have a little bit of a, um, how to say, relaxed uh, requirements uh, on proving things. So if, uh, you, you know, if you prove that not strictly, but uh, if you just, um, you know, prove that in like your own words, that's enough. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of good. Um, and also, uh, you know, this world of bonding curves, because you, we talk about invariants and we say that, you know, derivative of invariant is price and whatever, it very much reminds uh, theoretical mechanics, where you also have invariants, where you, um, you know, define, you know, momentum or like whatever, and then uh, start working with that. So you can uh, actually apply some uh, similar concepts or maybe whatever other similarities you see right and from the point of view of experimental physicists it's very important to be able to experiment so it's uh, important to have some um, you know to, to have your experimental setup having uh, certain tunable parameters in which you you actually can uh, try to tune and see what happens and also you can can make it safe you can say okay if I tune this it, it doesn't affect safety of the funds it actually affects uh, just how effectively the system is working so and that uh, that allows to even even after deployment to be uh, sort of in in experimental mode and bring the system to uh, like more effective state in production um, even when it's already working without having ability to upgrade code or change everything and uh, that's that's actually pretty much reminds how um, how I worked on uh, experimental setup during my PhD. It was cooling atoms to the state when they uh, behave like waves and become Bose-Einstein condensates. And th those are like a special state of matter. Um, like the, when, you know, the length of the matter wave becomes as big as the whole object you are dealing with. And that, that that was an experimental physics. So it was, uh, you know, happening in vacuum with lasers, whatever. And this, uh, you know, held by magnetic fields or other lasers. And that was quite a setup with really, really many tunable parameters. So, and the problem was to like that, um, these parameters were very, very low level, like, you know, current over there or like, uh, um, you know, laser, power or frequency over here and like 100 tunable parameters and only a very small region in this parameter space gave this uh, uh, and gave, gave this new state of matter so you had to understand what it's doing in uh, how it's manipulating the things before you actually get to that 
um, to that uh, new state of matter, because if you will just search in the parameter space, it's like too big, you will not find it. So, and uh, here it's actually the same thing. Here you, you like, especially with the new type of pools, we have uh, somewhat bigger than usual parameter space and the good kind of state is good efficiency of the pool, right? When it, has good liquidity. So we need to find a set of parameters where it's like, um, uh, where it, it really performs. And uh, for that, you kind of need to understand in a, intuitively really well, uh, like what it is uh, doing. So I need to develop intuition in this. That's, uh, and, and that's somewhat similar, although it's like, well, in physics, you model real world, in here, you model this uh, interesting world you have created with this invariance. But uh, yeah, after all, it's uh, uh, all about developing intuition. So they're both kind of systems where you cannot change too much, right? I, exp I imagine mm. this, these physic physics experiments, I mean, there must be very- Yeah, experiment. the experimental mm -hmm. setup is yeah. kind of, well, I mean, uh, you, you first build it, but when you built it, it's built. Right, you, you cannot change much. Yeah, maybe you can add, add a new laser, but uh, rebuilding everything is like total rebuilding because it's like you have uh, this metal uh, chambers with you know glass windows. It's uh, with ultra high vacuum. It's baked like it's uh, uh, it was heated and then cooled down to uh, basically release all the gases which could be trapped inside, so that there there is no gas left. So the vacuum is good. And then you have coils on top. You have lasers. You have optical systems with many mirrors and uh, prisms to. to to actually like um, to uh, to manipulate uh, lasers and uh, like rebuilding that is is uh, it's possible you can rebuild certain things but you don't usually do that you usually uh, have a system you manipulate uh, some parameters and only when you say okay the it's like not good enough because I don't know because this. Uh, uh, it should be done totally different because then you only then you rebuild it. But without that, you just have what you have and you tune it and you from the very beginning build it to be uh, to be tunable so that you don't have to to I don't know replace everything. Flexibility in a restricted setting. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. I would say that. I would say that. So it's like you know, and in our case. DAO can tune parameters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, DAO cannot replace the code, right? So, and here in experiments, you had an experimental setup, you could tune parameters, but uh, replacing the whole experimental setup, well, it's like a building new one, so. Dawn actually has a physics background. I'm sure she would be quite excited to, to hear this, but yeah, she, she will hear it later. So <laughs> thanks for sharing this, this is uh, fascinating. Um, so you you did your PhD right in uh, in Australia, if I understood correctly. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. Why did you leave Australia? So such a beautiful country. Well, I mean, uh, I thought to actually do some. Uh, well, first, firstly, the thought was to do some startup, and I didn't know which, but I went to Silicon Valley, right? And um, I also was attracted by cryptocurrency. That's why. That's like when I about at the time I was living in Australia, I learned about cryptocurrencies more or less, a little bit earlier than that. And in the US, I started uh, New Cypher. And after New Cypher, well, um, I would say, uh, I would say like while being in the US, I kind of was a little bit concerned about how things get, get developed in, in like, uh, U.S. economy, what U.S. regulators are uh, trying to do, and you know stuff like that. And then we thought, well, so also like with with visas, with like um, be for if if I wanted my relatives to enter the United States, that would be a little uh, difficult. So um, and if you take all of that together, I thought, well, maybe it's better to to live uh, somewhere else. Australia in principle is a great country, but it's far away from everything. Mm. 
right? And right now, actually, with, with COVID, you cannot actually, almost cannot leave Australia, right? They restrict people from, from leaving it, so... Uh, but even without it, it's like uh, it's, it's really far. So uh, when you want to fly somewhere, well, maybe flying to Asia is all right, but flying to Europe from Australia is really hard. Right. Makes sense. Great. Um, so there was there were a few things I wanted to touch on that that we discussed earlier. Um, I think in particular the um, the curve model. Um, which uh, you came up with. Uh, and I've recently looked at some statistics um, and it seems like over 75% of the curve in circulation are being locked. Um, so oh, that's, uh, that's actually like to, uh, you, to, to be like more precise, it's mm -hmm. 75% of uh, CRV in circulation without counting the locked tokens right um, so 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 it like could be confusing because you you could think that if you lock 100 you locked everything right but in in that definition it's actually if you lock 100 it means that you you have let's say i don't know um, let's say 100 million tokens circulating and 100 million tokens locked right Okay. So, so it's like not that 75%, which you, uh, uh, you, kind of, you may think of. It's uh, like 75% of what's um, currently not locked. Very well. I mean, thanks for clarifying. It's quite important. Um, but, but still, this is yeah. quite an astonishing number, right? Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. That's, uh, I think that's, that's clear. It's um, like because of this uh, positive feedback loop, which we created, like we, we distribute um, uh, fees only right. to those who participate in governance, who lock CRV. Right. right to the to v right and uh, v curve also gives you ability to vote also it's uh, because it does automatically snapshots because it's uh, erc uh, what is it? oh it's mini me top token right um so sort immovable mini me token right mini me is a standard uh, proposed by aragon which essentially allows you to get a snapshot at any uh block in the past okay yeah and that's that's important for voting but also it is very convenient for uh, any sorts of airdrops so imagine that you start some project which wants to i don't know to to give the token to um, uh, crv token holders right um, instead of like giving it to crv token holders they could give it to the ecrv and then they don't have to do anything special to uh, to find uh, like these ratios of balance to, to total supply uh, they don't need to iterate in a script they can write a smart contract which basically says, you know, this is balance off at this block, and this is total supply at this block for VECRV. And then, you know, the amount to be airdropped to this guy is total airdrop multiplied by balance off at that block divided by total supply at that block, and that's it. And you, you don't have to do any iteration because iteration was actually, um, it was indexed by this um, well, mini me token standard. And uh, uh, that's, uh, it's not, not great by the way to have it in a real token because it starts eating gas to be transferred and that, that's not great, but VECRV is not transferable. So uh, then it's, uh, it, it kind of makes sense to, to have this property over there, which um, simplifies airdrops and then airdrops happen to typically the ECRV. Uh, so the ECRV holders get uh, all sorts of perks like, you know, airdrops. Um, well, right now they even, uh, they even get bribed to vote. <laughs> Um, right, so you, you found this, uh, maybe if we simplify like a scalable way to airdrop right to, to the, yeah. the rewards to the, to the, right. to the V curve yeah. uh, holders, which is important, otherwise the, the fees might up, eat up. 
quite uh, quite a lot of this uh, of this right, revenue. Right. Yeah, but also they of course get uh, the um, uh, get the fees which the platform gets and whatever. So it's like they get all sorts of stuff. And earlier you went into a little bit of uh, details about the tree um, pool. So you now have, I mean, initially you started as a, as a stable coin platform and now you do support uh, more flexible or let's say non-packed assets as well. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this? What was the experience in doing so? And oh, maybe yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's actually still an experiment ongoing, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is pretty interesting. Like you imagine that you have um, pro probably easy to think in liquidity density terms. Imagine, uh, you know, Uniswap 2 bonding curve, like the hyperbola. Uh, then in that, you have more or less uh, the same liquidity density everywhere, right? And uh, the idea of, of three crypto pool is that you have liquidity density going up somewhere in some narrow range of prices, right? So it's kind of... Um, going like that smoothly and then this high liquidity region you you can move right so when the price moves you can actually move their high liquidity towards the price um, and apparently moving high liquidity towards the price causes a loss right mm -hmm. and that's inevitable like well I'm not a mathematician, I will not prove it, but it's uh, uh, if, if the price went there and you move liquidity density towards it, you, you lose money, right? Uh, but uh, we, we uh, to, you know, we, uh, we agree with that, that, okay, it's losing money to, to tune this, um, uh, to move this liquidity density. But uh, maybe, maybe we can try find such parameters such size of this liquidity density region that if it follows uh, their you know average price uh, then uh, maybe uh, maybe the losses will be less than profits and actually we enforce that we move liquidity density only when the loss is uh, um, smaller than half of the profit we've made interesting so in, but then you need a time frame right where you measure the profit i suppose or uh we have uh, we actually measure it from the bonding curve itself the profit or the anticipated the profit. profit no no the profit but the uh, profit is, is are the is coming from the trading fees right so or... uh yes it is coming from the trading fees but we are not measuring trading fees we are measuring uh, properties of the bonding curve Okay. It's uh, a little bit like, um, uh, that's why we call it virtual price, like we call it in stable coin pools. So uh, what virtual price is, uh, well, essentially uh, you, uh, uh, well, first of all, what's the physical meaning of invariant in that system? The physical meaning of invariant is basically um, how, uh, if you have everything balanced, in a stable coin pool, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, how much money the pool will have. When you have everything balanced, prices of all tokens are equal to each other. And uh, then how many tokens you have is exactly uh, how much money you have, right? And when you move along uh, the bonding curve, right? Wherever you are, the invariant is the same. And virtual price is the same. Virtual price is essentially invariant uh, um, divided by the total number of tokens. So basically, let's say if the price has suddenly changed, right? Uh, what what is the total value of tokens in the pool when the prices change back to normal? That's the meaning of invariant, at least in like a stable point invariant. And here it's kind of a little bit the same, right? So we can measure how much, um, well, how much, uh, uh, how much do we have? But uh, the interesting part is that invariant here is not, um, well, it's not, it's not so easy to find a physical meaning. So yeah, invariant is not uh, mm, like, it's not dollars, I would say this. Uh, it's, um, I don't know. Um, 
let's say for three crypto, it's measured in cubic root of dollars multiplied by ethers multiplied by bitcoins, right? Okay. Yeah. How did you choose this? Uh... Uh, well, I mean, it's uh, simple if it's, uh, uh, well, easy. the easiest thing is to think of it as like, as a constant product invariant, right? Let's say balance of, uh, um, balance of, um, you know, uh, yeah. USD multiplied by balance of uh, um, ETH multiplied by balance of Bitcoin is the same. It's not exactly that because we have this high liquidity region, but if you throw this away, it will be like balance of pool, it will be like that. And the units of account will be that. But, you know, if you just take uh, dollars multiplied by ethers multiplied by uh, Bitcoin as a unit of account, it will be um, a little bit like measuring uh, deposits in cubic bitcoins and uh, cubic bit bitcoins are a little bit weird so we took cubic root of that <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, yeah but uh, but yeah it's it's fun like um, yeah like what's your tvl mm, it's uh, thousand cubic bitcoins <laughs> <laughs> what a great metric to quantify <laughs> Um, so your LP tokens in the in the uh, tree pool are they they're still fungible tokens, right? Or mm. so so the adjustment of the of the deepness of the liquidity, I guess, is done for all the LPs in, yes, in once, right? Yes, yes, right. Which is which is I haven't tried Uniswap version three yet myself, but I have understood that the LPs need to allocate which region they want to concentrate liquidity. Uh, yes, on. yes, right. and, and that's actually uh, at least to me that feels like a potential vulnerability. Um, well, imagine a Mav bot trader, right? Who uh, looks what's happening in mempool, right? And imagine that a big trader tries to trade on Uniswap, right? So the arbitrage trader could narrowly deposit money exactly in that at that price where the trade is going to happen, right? So instead of being like here it's like here and it's much less funds uh, are needed to uh, to be comparable with the liquidity density which is uh, like which all the um, depositors have right, right. and um, then almost all fees which that pool makes will be taken by that trader because but, he's he's the one with the deepest uh, density yes. in this particular region, right? right? Right. But of course, this by itself wouldn't give you anything because you you need to kind of trade back, and uh, then you need to arbitrage. But maybe the trader will arbitrage this elsewhere, and basically instead of paying, um, I don't know, zero point three percent fee to Uniswap it will take 0.3% fee. Well, after all, it will be like uh, as if this trader actually uh, made uh, like a zero fee trade on Uniswap and, uh, you know, traded back elsewhere and didn't leave any fees for Uniswap liquidity providers. So this kind of attack is possible and that's, known and um yeah i don't know how much of that happens in the wild but i think it was noticed a few times i don't know how much uh, of this front running happens in practice but when you look at look at total numbers you can see oh you know uniswap uh, liquidity providers made this much in fees but how many percent of that is made by those guys and how much didn't come to to like passive liquidity providers that's a good question so so that's, uh, I guess, uh, kind of a flaw of this model. Well, you can deal with this flaw. There are, there are ways, I think. But yeah, it's fundamentally that. Wow. Um, so uh, do you remember who first mentioned this kind of attack? Um, is there any name for this? Mm, I don't remember. I don't remember. Because after, think... after sandwich uh, attacks? And yeah, I, th I think I've seen this, um, well... The first time I've seen it mentioned when somebody saw somebody else trying to to actually execute this attack. So creative. 
Uh, yeah. Equipe and DeFi. It's it's a beauty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> very. Uh, but yeah, you, you need like very adversarial thinking here. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, security. It's it's really at the at the core of these decentralized systems where we don't have a trust kind of in a centralized entity, and then uh, yeah. people get really creative. It's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, but you know, good thing with this attack is that it, nobody is like really losing money; it's just losing peace. So, yeah, yeah so it's uh, not not really unsafe, but uh, not cool for some. Some kind of a sniping attack, right? You could say. Yeah, like yeah, a, a lot of yeah, like sniping. Yes, yeah, yeah, you can say that. <laughs> oh great um yeah DeFi is surprising me over and over again every every other day so it's uh, it's just a beauty to to be in that space yeah yeah and also like uh, yeah some sometimes it's terrifying sometimes surprising in a good way but um you know no, never boring never boring exactly we always need popcorn <laughs> yeah yeah I probably need to you know, popcorn you know, will will go to the moon i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of innovation um you came up with meta pools right like a mm. well now it's it's not that not that recent but man, many months ago you came up yeah. with, with these meta pools that try to kind of increase liquidity efficiency by reusing for right. example the three curve pool token um, could you briefly explain to the audience maybe how they work and why mm -hmm. they're secure? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. It's, um, well, you can imagine that there is uh, each pool is represented by a token, right? And when you deposit money in the pool, then um, you you basically have LP token represented, representing current, uh, you know, slice of current token distribution in the pool. Right, uh, but you know, for we have three pool, which is uh, basically USD denominated. So we have USD stable coins in it. And imagine that you, um, well, if it's USD denominated, although this uh, um, price of LP token is constantly growing, but it's not growing super quickly. So you you can use this LP token as a stable coin itself. And the uh, thing is that this um, virtual price, how we call it, right, the invariant divided by a number of tokens, it cannot go down. It can only go up. As the pool makes money, it goes up uh, slowly, but it does. And this means that you, you can use this as a stable coin. And really, if somebody tries to, to manipulate uh, if you use the value of this, uh, like virtual price as the value of this stable coin, it's only like can be manipulated up, but not down. And when it's manipulated up, it's real, uh, like real money made by that coin. So uh, yeah, it's, it appears to be like that, that using a pool, which changes between, you know, one currency and uh, another, like and LP token, um, th this setting doesn't get it manipulated, but at the same time, you get a really great efficiency because you can immediately use all the depth of that pool and have like 50%, let's say, um, your token and 50% uh, of any like USD from that pool pretty much. So it works almost as if you had um, you know, three uh, pools with the same TVL, let's say, uh, token to DAI, token to USDC, token to USDT. Uh, so you need three times less money to achieve uh, the same slippage. Right. And uh, lowering even, I mean, lowering if it, like uh, liquidity efficiency even even more um, makes DeFi so much more competitive to CFI, right? Where you have like right, 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 limit exactly. order books and you yeah. can't do such but, constructs. You know, this comes at a price though, because or its complexity is higher. And mm -hmm. uh, like, even if everything works correctly, which it does, it uses more gas. And on Ethereum, more gas is, is important. So we, uh, uh, we have this compromise here and uh, that, uh, well, on, on layer two though, that's, that's a no-brainer. Speaking of compromises and um, complexity, so what is kind of your biggest crisis that you experience at Curve? Well, okay. I think uh, 
maybe maybe one of the biggest crises was this um, uh, this situation early on when the curve got started and the pool which uh, um, the very first pool which was created was uh, uh, was vulnerable yeah mm -hmm. and uh, getting everything mig migrated uh, safely without uh, uh, like without this ability to pause the smart contract that's uh, that's tricky and that's tricky well there was another kind of crisis but which, which was maybe somewhat scary but it didn't uh, uh, didn't really um, affect any user funds um, it's like when we suddenly made a uh, like um, it made a vote which uh, doesn't uh, um, well when we were enabling our fees uh, on curve uh, the the vote was uh, basically put in the wrong uh, contract address and uh, yeah so um, it was not easy to uh, to 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 fix that without uh, having upgradeability so but as well it worked uh, it's just um yeah tricky you know, it's uh it requires to be creative and when you work with like uh with things like that but fortunately like on, only that very first problem we had in the like was it 20th of january 2020 or something uh only that very first problem was uh requiring to to act uh fast and well, and not, not really so at some point, not us to act fast, but users to act fast. Because like, and yeah, it's, I don't think many users today would migrate uh, so quickly because over the, back then. Different demographics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it happened so fast. So um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, those were probably um, some of the, biggest at least uh, technical related uh crisis that's beautiful i mean these these kind of events they make you stronger and uh, i'm sure they had a a huge impact on 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 curve itself afterwards once it yeah grew, like, yeah we are for example like we introduced this uh you know killable time first two months and so far you know two months we've always found enough for that and we, we want to have things decentralized uh, eventually. And, uh, you know, two months is, uh, to, to us is, yeah, it's, well, I mean, even, even when it's within the first two months, we cannot take customer funds, but we can um, still like kind of um, execute the kill switch. Uh, well, not even centrally though, the multi sig still. Like in, even there is no com company on that multi sig at the moment, yeah. but still, it's uh, I consider multi sigs as you know somewhat centralized, right? So it's uh, I, I would say I wouldn't I, I would not be comfortable trusting uh, customer funds to a multi sig whether controlled by uh, by the company or not. Right. Because in the end, it's uh, right. Because yeah, this yeah, yeah. Like it's right. at the end, like the identities yeah. of people on the multi sig are not so hard to find, and somebody could, uh, I don't know, try to extort or whatever money, and uh, that's yeah. that's even not safe for them. So, right. yeah. so what protocols, uh, like for example, this kill switch within two months? What other protocols can you recommend to new DeFi projects and? A lot of all our students want to create their own DeFi protocols. Um, what would you recommend? Mm, what to create? Mm. I mean, what what security protocols or safety measures um, ah. should they should they adopt such that they can kind of avoid um, maybe some some headaches down the line? Right, right. Yeah. Well, I think um, if well, good, good thing is to to have the code uh, like really readable. The shorter, the better. Um, maybe have all the better to not scatter things across multiple contracts. So maybe uh, better to make a contract, you know, flat, right? And uh, in in this case, you you don't uh, have to jump 
somewhere to, to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like some solidity contracts, I, I read really well. And that's, uh, but that's not always the case. Um, and also like well, using Vipers, uh, of course, uh, I would always recommend that. Uh, writing tests, like not just unit tests, also stateful tests, which uh, test all the like parameter space and uh, make sure that some, you know, can, something you don't want doesn't happen, right? You, you need to figure out what are the, uh, what would detect bad events, right? And instead of detecting them in real life, you would detect bad events in the state, stateful tests. And uh, yeah, it's uh, always uh, always great to have your contract uh, hacked uh, inside a test. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, right, DeFi protocols are very composable. Uh, you're using, for example, RV, or you started yeah. out with Compound. Um, so your tests specifically, are they mostly targeting um, uh, your contracts? Yeah, they are, they are mostly targeting our contracts and their contracts, they are mostly like, using um, sort of mocks, which, uh, um, which sort of uh, uh, imitate functionality of those tokens, right? Okay. But you could do real though as well. You could uh, run tests on main network and uh, use real, real smart contracts de deployed on a real chain. And maybe you could run tests as performantly, but you could find things something where we are not yet um, is let's say when we uh, run um, things like on a um, like totally like real network especially with meta pools like you can take the base pool as like being a real pool run tests against the real base pool with the new pool and figure out that the losses didn't happen so something like that but that's but that would be fun right and that's definitely possible. Uh, we have we have recently written an academic paper and a tool to to kind of extract profitable opportunities from the DeFi graph uh, through composable transactions, right? So, um, do you think we need more such tools that look at specific blockchain states and try to search the space for possible? like application level vulnerabilities. I'm not speaking now about smart contract vulnerabilities such as re-entrancy mm -hmm. or missing, missing um, uh, modifiers, but rather um, um, pump and dump opportunities or Oracle manipulation manipul uh, manipulations um, or such, such composable uh, dangers. Um, what's your view on, 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 on how to yeah, get out yeah, of the yeah, that's a, that, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. And um, yeah, even like Oracle problem is like something we didn't much touch. Well, I think I only touched it uh, very recently, but not uh, with external oracles. We uh, pretty much made an oracle for a trick crypto pool uh, to say what the LP token price is. Okay, so, so this is your own oracle you, that you're running, or? Oh well, no, it's we, nobody runs it. It's uh, it's a smart contract which just has a view method which uh, calculates. Uh, well, there are exponentially moving averages for the for each uh, uh, coin prices, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, from that we can find uh, the uh, LP token price in a, I would say, a lower bound on that, uh, which is not my non manipulatable. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's uh, kind of an oracle for, for lending purposes. Um, well, uh, should be not, uh, well, not attackable by sandwich attacks. So, uh, and not using any external oracles. Very good. Um, I hope students listened. You're now challenged. Please uh, look into this. <laughs> Try to sandwich it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but... yeah. But, but speaking of, of lending and borrowing, um, um, when, when, when do you plan to go into lending and borrowing? I mean, I'm still looking for, when do we see 100x leverage on chain, actually? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, at least you can, um, you can lend and borrow on uh, third-party platforms against uh, Curve LP tokens. And this would be, well, 
Yeah, and if you want to do that for speculation, you can do that with the Tree Crypto Pool because it's not stable in price actually. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm I'm actually doing that, but not for uh, not for speculation. I'm doing that for just just borrowing. I see. Okay, but the um, I mean maybe you're aware of other platforms. I'm aware of Alpha Homora where you can get up to eight yeah. x leverage. Mm -hmm. um, so we measured uh, the, we, we looked at the closed borrowing positions from the three curve pool, mm -hmm. um, because it's, 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 I think the only major stablecoin pool there, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and, and interestingly, there were no liquidations uh, recorded. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it seems this like even, I mean, as far as I recall our data correctly, it seems like this is a safe, yeah. like in quote safe, um, yeah, well, I mean, if you go 10x on non three pool, I don't think you ever could experience liquidations, really. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's probably yeah. Well, I think you can go 100x really. It's just uh, well, maybe it's just for safety they don't do that, but uh, yeah, I think 100x will will also have almost not have liquidations. And but but really, like with these leverage platforms. Do you think it makes sense to basically go high and higher leverage until you start having liquidations? Like how, I mean, how, how would one approach that? I guess it depends on the borrowing fees as well, right? Mm. The, the, the leverage factor is not necessarily the limiting factor, but if the mm. fees are just too high, then... Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you remember that in um first half of 2020 andre cronier prototyped with uh, leverage using uh, curve pools and uh, yeah, I, I don't remember what was the maximum he was trying to do. I think uh, 100,000 X. <laughs> well, that was a little bit too too dangerous, but uh, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> um, well, it was a prototype thing, though. Prototypes are great. I mean, we need, we need to try out new things, right? And, and yeah, yeah, 100,000 X. <laughs> how, to, how to get liquidated with stable coins. Very well, very well. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask further a bit your view on MEV. We already touched on, on MEV uh, regarding, so, so you mentioned that you might be thinking of, of um, using these uh, private relay services yeah. to, to protect uh, users from, uh -huh. yeah, from various actors. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, kind of a, probably a good, good thing to try. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, uh, it, it's fascinating that these days to uh, to do like flash loan kind of arbitrage, you you actually uh, well not necessarily you, you you just do that. You you also use MEV to uh, not have that publicly available on in mempool, but also like who guarantees that those miners who you broadcast to um, don't uh, kind of do some sneaky things. And uh, after all, they have their kind of own private shared mempool. And um, like if somebody kind of, ex if somebody shows this information somewhere uh, that, that allows to do all the same thing with, as with real mempool. But, you know, so far it works. So, I mean, why not, of course? It's just, yeah. uh, it's just basically, um, you know, with public mempool, um, everyone who can front run, and with uh, MEV, only members of the club can front run. Right, it's it's kind of feels like we're introducing or reintroducing some of the CFI centralized finance components, right? Where there are some gatekeepers that have uh, like prioritized access to to this yeah, financial yeah, information yeah. and can exploit this for this information asymmetry for failing to the game. Which yeah, yeah, yeah. that's um, yeah, that, that that's true. That's true. Right. So I mean, on the technical side, I think there are means to fix this, right? You could have like. A, I don't know, trusted hardware modules that, mm. um, that where you send the, the transactions to so that nobody else but maybe the this module can can see it who which then forms the block for example yeah um, yep. on the other hand not every raspberry pi will be able to run a node <laughs> which which it is not <laughs> anyway but yeah. yeah, I mean, that depends depends right on 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 what kind of yeah system architecture there. But there's there's certainly a lot of room for improvement. Um, yeah, yeah. 
And I guess we need more novelty to keep the chain decentralized and open. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Any any final remarks you would uh, like to share with our students? Um, that kind of something, maybe some exciting news that that you think will come in the future, or something that that surprised you recently. Well, I think uh, it's uh, well for me. It's always exciting to do uh, research, even though it's uh, even on on liquidity pools and. The, we will uh, try those with uh, different sorts of assets and that's uh, um, well that will be pretty pretty interesting i would say and it, it like feels like it's there is a lot to um a lot to learn there a lot is uh, like you know, even though we like created this system like an experimental setup but what it can do we uh, don't Uh, fully understand yet like how efficient can it be and like uh, what's what's the maximum achievable efficiency uh, because like when you simulate it yes you do some assumptions but in reality the, the assumptions are not exactly like in simulations and uh, you you like really need to experiment with that and maybe this process of looking at what's happening on chain and tuning the models to uh, to simulate what happens on chain better to be able to predict where uh, like how to improve further this is something really interesting and i think this uh, deserves some uh, you know some research activity wonderful words uh, for closing thanks to, thank you so much michael um, i mean you have truly shaped the defi space with your analytical mind and uh, The biggest DeFi protocol to date. So it's thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for for chatting.